many places, the Bible warns us that this type of moral lobotomy occurs as a direct result of rejecting God and seeking our own desires. The problem in recognizing this from a human perspective, however, is that few societies or individuals consciously set out to do this. Typically, their falling away is a slow, incremental process that almost always begins with good intentions. The attempt to reach into heaven only later is revealed to be an escalator into hell. Nowhere is this reality more tragically realized than in the changes this century has brought to the way we raise our kids. Oh, the cow kicked belly in the belly in the belly. Would you shut the hell up? <laughs> During the first 400 years of America's history, child-rearing practices were largely based on traditions and philosophies found in Scripture. Good morning, children. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He made me to lie down in great pastures. Prayer, Bible studies, discipline, and a strong emphasis on self-control and self-sacrifice were customary. Children were trained primarily by their parents and then brought into the adult community while still in their early teens. They were then expected to behave as adults, remaining under the authority and supervision of their parents until they married and started their own families. As the 19th century drew to a close, however, profound cultural changes began to chip away at this ideal. More and more, the family was getting lost in the bustle of the Industrial Revolution. The complexities of the modern city, the explosive growth, the changing nature of work, the proliferation of new ideas and moralities, the almost endless possibilities and problems of this brave new world often outran the ability of families to adapt. Perhaps most significantly, as the economy boomed, success seemed more and more a question of how much money one had. Increasingly, fathers and sometimes even mothers began surrendering their child-rearing responsibilities in order to chase after the so-called American dream. Add to all this the mass production of the automobile. Suddenly, a whole new world of options opened up outside the family circle, including a peer-regulated system of dating. Take me home! In the midst of all this upheaval, a quiet revolution of ideas concerning child-rearing was also taking place. Men like John Dewey were proposing that the state step in and take over the training of America's youth. Referred to today as the father of the nation's public school system, Dewey's dream was a socialist society, his own piece of heaven on earth. This year, 29 million U.S. youngsters are going to school. Youngsters to kindergarten, to the grade, to high school. All greatly impressionable now. Tomorrow, masters of a nation's destiny. And this year, and then there was the modern concept of adolescence proposed by research psychologist G. Stanley Hall. Basing his ideas on the theory of evolution, Hall suggested that adolescence was a distinct stage through which each person passed on their way from a primitive child to a civilized adult. To optimize this transition, Hall advocated removing young people as much as possible from the adult community, isolating them in their own institution. Now hold on, Miss Fox. It's all very well to teach my boy to paint pretty pictures and build birdhouses, but he doesn't even know his multiplication table. Enter now the federal government. Flush with the new power to tax and the dream of a bureaucrat-sponsored utopia, law and policymakers set about addressing the unique challenges of the modern era. High on their list of priorities were the special needs of America's youth. Child labor laws were passed and longer schooling was required. Gradually, top-down, state-run schools became the rule of the day. The perfect laboratory for testing Dewey's and Hall's theories had become a reality. The era of the isolated adolescent had begun. The book Dancing in the Dark captures the essence of this critical moment in modern history. In the 20th century, adolescence became less a time to prepare for adulthood than an attempt to delay or prevent it it created a self-contained world in which prolonged immaturity could sustain itself. 
The new ideology of adolescence made possible a new youth community with a powerful influence that could surpass any outside influence on its members' lives. Though perhaps well-intentioned, the problem with this new ideology was its denial of biblical principles. God never intended for young people to live in a self-contained world and learn about life from one another. No matter how powerful this new adolescent subculture seemed on the surface, without the discipline of parental wisdom, it was and is doomed. How do I know? We'll read the owner's manual. Proverbs tells us that the glory of a young person is their strength. This vitality, this willingness to take on the world, to challenge the status quo, to take risks, is among the most valuable and glorious characteristics of youth. God loves it and loves to make use of it. Jesus' disciples were young, and it was a teenage David that God sent to confront Goliath. But this strength is only one part of the overall picture. The proverb goes on to say that the splendor of an old man is his gray head, a metaphor for wisdom. Few things in life are more effective in gaining wisdom than fearing God and then simply living, bearing up under the trials of life. So while it may have been a young David that God used to slay Goliath, it was an older and wiser David that God sent to command the armies of Israel. And herein lies the balance and the wisdom of God, the strength of youth married to the wisdom of age. And this is why the family is the most basic unit of the kingdom of God, why the first eight chapters of Proverbs are filled with fervent pleas to learn wisdom from our parents, and why God wrote by his own hand the first commandment that deals with interpersonal relationships. Honor your father and mother. Tragically, the social experiment developed by men like Dewey and Hall ignored this truth and struck a tremendous blow against the already crumbling bulwark of the American family. But another, even more devastating blow was to follow. This is the Vorthos Forum, and we approve this message.